folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, doing a movie review this week. It's a fun, exciting, and amazing space adventure that came out on July 13, 1984. And I still love it, even to this day. It's the wonderful classic, The Last Starfighter. It's a story about what was it like if you were a teenager living in a trailer park called Starlight Star Bright, you want to play a video arcade game called Starfighter, where suddenly you'd be able to earn a lot of points in order to win, until all of a sudden the creator of the Starfighter game appears and you want to play in the game for real. Well, that's what happened with Alex Logan, too, just when he was getting ready for college. But unfortunately, things just seems to change for the better. Well, sort of. Well, anyway, this was a fun movie. I remember watching this uh, on TV when it was on. I, I watched it, like, back when I was a kid. I They played this on on channels like TBS and the Disney Channel and I believe it was also on Select TV, yeah, HBO. Yeah, I, I even taped it on HBO too uh, before I picked this uh, wonderful Blu-ray set which I thought it was decent because it's actually a, a 25th anniversary edition from 2009 and the one that I got uh, which I picked up at Target for $7.50 a good price it comes with a Blu-ray, a DVD, and digital copy all together. So this is really cool. <laughs> and the transfer on the Blu-ray, as well as the DVD, is just basically your typical Universal, always putting DNR and inch enhancement on the transfer, just like what they did with their HD DVD transfer for the film. Because I know the original uh, DVD release uh, was um, was a a 35 millimeter print that's that's actually has a lot of grain and everything. But there there is grain in the film too, artificial grain included. But for the most part, um, some of the the characters does look a little waxy at times. So, but otherwise. Um, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, I, I've seen worse coming from Universal. I mean, I know Weird Science gets the the worst rap of a ball when it comes to the transfer. And I know uh, Predator Ultimate Hunters Edition gets that too. And of course, the movie Moontrap on Blu-ray and DVD suffers the worst out of all of them. And I know it, it, it just... I'm just getting tired of uh, studios always using DNR as a right result to actually clean all the grain from an original print that this movie was was done on. I mean, it almost acts like this movie was done digitally. Like they're trying to make it look like a Pixar cartoon or something like that. And they all look like wax figures. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's not that bad. It, it looks a lot better than I thought. You know, at times, I just watch the film in full form and it just gets better and better as it turns out. So, in the end. And, of course, uh, <laughs> yeah, it does come with an advertisement, uh, but it's a digital copy. She yeah, has uh, Coraline, Despicable Me, and Sanctum 3D. Yeah. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> And has all the extras as included for this uh, 25th anniversary edition on the back. Um, I actually love the cover art that they chose uh, of Alex Rogan, you know, with this awesome, uh, awesome uh, Starfighter ship that you got. Just looks really cool. Yeah, it's the 
when she suddenly joins the Star League and everything. <laughs> Just amazing. Yeah, the film was uh, produced by Universal along with Lawnmower. Yeah, best known for doing TV shows like Full House, Dallas, Knott's Landing. And they had worked on other films too, like Power, American Anthem, Tank, uh, The Big Wet Run, you know, even The Boy Who Could Fly. Yeah, that's the company. And they teamed up to, to make this movie. Considering that we did have the first film called Tron from Disney, which is the first film to actually use um, early stage of computer animation, you know, CGI, which was very primitive for its time, and so was this movie. It was very primitive, and but this is far different from Tron, where they actually use actual um, real-life objects to actually create those, those shots alone. They actually use uh, Cray computers, which are actually uh, bars of, that comes in rainbow colors, if you think about it. Yeah, it was one of those bars that they use to, to create uh, the CGI effects on, on the starships and all the other ships around that moves around completely in the sky. And I, I think instead of actually using actual models, which I know they probably had a mix of that. So they, they did a test for that. Uh, it was actually done by Digital Productions in California, so they they teamed up. So it was done on Cray XMP uh, supercomputers to actually create those effects. Um, the drawings of all the, the chips around are, are actually done by Rob Cobb, who's been known for doing Aliens, Star Wars, and, and Conan the Barbarian. So, so he, he actually had worked all the ships that they had to actually put it on screen. So it, it was done for like probably like 60 frames or even more frames per second. And it takes like a lot of, uh, by using, along with 36-bit uh, pixels um, in the mix, so it, it actually cost like 14 million dollars when they did it. So it really worked um, for that budget alone. But it had to take a lot of time and energy to actually put it in so that way it would fit the film very well, as it seems. So <laughs> That's cool. But of course, they want this movie to become a lot bigger than Star Wars, because I know in the 80s we were getting a lot of Star Wars movies, and they were trying to do something like that. So this was trying to be like Star Wars in a way, but with video games, uh, kind of like Tron. So, But it has a wonderful story, and it's fun, and has some great characters, and the fact that it's set in a trailer park, it just looks amazing. So, But let, let's get to the film. It stars Lance Guess, Dan O'Hurley, who from the movie Halloween Free, Season of the Witch. He also went on to do Robocop, along with the sequel. He yeah, as the head of uh, the CEO of OCP Communications. Yeah. <laughs> Catherine Mary Stewart, who was in that bad film called The Apple. Yeah, that awful musical from 1980. Yeah, she went on to do Night of the Comet along with Weekend of Bernie's. Yeah. Robert Preston who's been best known for playing the, the music man Harold Hill. Yeah, for those who don't know. And this was actually based on that character alone and he's a lovable uh, con man who owns um, Starfighter, so he created it. Yes, Atari. <laughs> and this was, of course, his last film because uh, a few years later he passed away in 87. He was only in his 60s at the time. Yeah, of course, Lance Guess, uh, when he did an interview, he, he thought he was in the 70s for, for that enough energy. Yeah. I, I guess that's what he fought. Anyway. Uh, 
Uh, Norman Snow, K.E. Cutter, Barbara Boston, Chris Hepburn, Dan Mason, Bernard Washington, John O'Leary, George McDaniel, uh, Owen Bush, and Will Wheaton. Yes, Will Wheaton, who went on to do uh, Stand By Me, and he uh, later went on to, to do the TV series Star Trek The Next Generation as Wesley Crusher. And of course, uh, he went on to do other stuff too. <laughs> He was also in, in the horror film The Curse. It's written by Jonathan R. Bayou. Yeah, he went on to do other stuff. And I, I know he also went on to direct the movie My Science Project. And he did all those other movies too that follows. And it's directed by Nick Castle, who actually had work uh, with John Carpenter. In fact, he was the man responsible for playing Michael Myers. That's right, that's him or right. And it's hard to believe he directed this, and he also went on to direct uh, Dennis the Menace, the 1993 movie. So it's really awesome. The movie begins at a local trailer park, which has a lot of mobile homes, sort of in a suburban town somewhere in California called Starlight Star Bright. We meet a young teenager named Alex Rogan, who's played by Lance Guess. He lives with his mom, along with his younger brother named Louis. He also uh, was getting ready for college, so he was trying to wait for his financial aid to arrive on the mail. While he basically ditches his friends just when he was going to go out to see a drive-in movie and hang out um, everywhere, including his girlfriend named Maggie who's played by Catherine Mary Stewart. Uh, which, of course, they were having plans together in the future, so they'd be able to stay together and, and do and have fun and be able to go to college together. But unfortunately, she didn't want to leave uh, her granny behind. So she's trying to take good care of her. Anyway, more often, he plays an arcade game called Starfighter, which is located uh, inside a a uh, a small mart that's inside the trailer park, yeah, you know, where it has uh, all the foods and all his other supplies and everything in that store. Where where it's a game about where the player defends the frontier from Xur and the Kodan Amada in a space battle. For those who earn the highest score, it will be approached by the game's vendor named Centauri, who's played by the wonderful Robert Preston, which he actually invites uh, Alex for a ride later on. But in the nick of time, just after he won the arcade game and trying to relive his dreams and everything, he basically lost his financial aid. He didn't get received the mail and he felt disappointed. So suddenly Satari arrived, invited Alex to go on a journey to a planet called Rylos. Because for those who don't know, Centauri, who not only invented the game, and I know he even said that the arcade game was going to be sent to Las Vegas, but it winds up in the trailer park. He's an alien. So then um, he also sends uh, an android duplicate of Alex himself, which is the beta unit. So that way he'll take his place, only pretending that you know Alex hadn't actually been sent over there. So that, that way they don't get uh, mixed up here. And so they'll know that Alex was here the whole time in the trailer park, and while he's just, while the real Alex is just going around becoming. A starfighter, the last starfighter. So he winds up being recruited um, in the Wylon Star League. That's represent just like the game with all the ships around, wonderful ships. That's where you see the crew, all premature bald. Yeah, both male and female. 
have like long puffy hair but premature bald and they speak in in a different language but they had to put in the the voice communicators so that way Alex will be able to understand what they're saying because it don't sound like they're saying pita like that and then you see all of these creatures joining in the crew yeah a lot of creatures different ones so they they team up together yeah including that battalion named Grid who's played by Lance O'Hurley yeah he's very good <laughs> so anyway Alex learns that the characters from the game represents a conflict between the Star League and the Kodan Empire which suddenly the latter was being led by Zur who became a traitor who of course the Kodan Empire had promised to control of the Rylos he then learned that the entire game was a test so that way he'll be able to fight for real but unfortunately because that's where we get to see um, the crew actually working together and of course they had that chant victory or death victory or death victory or death victory or death <laughs> so then we see um, a holographic production of Zur basically discovers um, the ranks that's happening and and suddenly their his plan was to actually attack the Star League so they'll be able to destroy it and take over so it was up to Alex to actually stop him but unfortunately he wasn't really ready for it and suddenly he decided to ditch it and just move on with his life because he was afraid that you know he, he might get killed well it gets worse because by the time um, he arrived back um, he got slapped by Maggie I'm only to find out that yes he did discover the beta unit of himself <laughs> and of course that beta unit as we all know actually was a lot funnier than I thought I mean he, he basically takes off his head uh, in one scene you know, inside his brother's room and um, and then there are times when he he basically laugh uh, very strangely when he was uh, inside the truck you know with Maggie and, and his friends <laughs> this is when they're hanging out and all that going around <laughs> so then we begin to learn that yes he isn't what what he seems so yeah, he had to take over so that way you know, things will go as, as planned. So then, all of a sudden, we begin to see uh, more creatures arriving inside the trailer park. And they turn out to be the, the Zato Zans. And that's when Centauri arrived on the scene to actually, because uh, he left them behind, to actually uh, kill one of the Zano Zans and he got shot of course and and this is where he says to Alex get a good look Alex you bet your asteroids you'll be seeing more of them what this is a Zano Zan an interstellar hit beast courtesy of Zur Zur why is he after me somehow you found out you're a starfighter you see Alex you gotta go back you stay here, you're dog meat. Trust Centauri on this, my boy. Because in two hours, this park will be crawling with ten Xanozans. Just for one thought of a microscopic little mine, kill Alex Rogan. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just love his sense of humor uh, in this movie. <laughs> it just really works. So then he came back. This time... Um, just when he got shot, um, he, he started dying. Well, we know what happens later, so I, I don't want to give too much away. Um, so now he decided to work with uh, Grid to actually fight all the creatures and, and all the ships that are attacking them. So they had to go around uh, fighting inside that ship that, that actually moves around and 
you can definitely see how interesting the graphics look as it goes. Um, my favorite moment was when suddenly it spins out of control. Yeah, when they push that uh, that button on on side to actually destroy all the the ships that are attacking them. You know, because at times they were hiding out and then they were moving around here and there. So yeah, so you basically see Grid on the back. They just telling the Alex what to do, so it's always good to have someone helping them out. So he's begun to fight uh, all of them completely, <laughs> shooting them, firing them, and wow, <laughs> awesome! And that's where we see Zer, you know, <laughs> just suddenly uh, working with uh, the Kodon crew. Until, yeah, he was about to leave too, and he did. He escaped from the pod, and I, I remember. And yes, they all, the low quid and and along with the Kodan officer were together, and they and they got damaged too at the end, and they said, "Damage report, divert, divert." She won't answer the helm. We're locking the moon's gravitation pull. What would we do? We die. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Uh, so, yeah, they got destroyed. And, and now um, the, the Star League had won. They won the battle. They won the war. So now... He gets to become the last starfighter to actually fight against some more creatures that are taking over. So now um, he decided to join with the Star League. Uh, the only thing is, they, he's about to come back, but he wanted to bring uh, Maggie around for the ride. But unfortunately, Maggie just wants to stay with Granny to take over. But with all these decisions uh, that he had to make, because I know they, they found out about the beta unit, and I know the beta unit was doing, you know, a lot of crazy stuff, and, you know, not paying attention and everything. <laughs> you know, like, he, he's always storm like, for example, the beta unit started to work on the antenna at times, you know, <laughs> and, he, and he also helped Alex out by going after those Xanalzans, you know, so he had to drive the the truck, and he says, I owe you one, Alex, and then he just destroys it. <laughs> yeah, because this is where he found out uh, that he wasn't Alex alone. He's just the beta unit of himself. <laughs> and that's where we get that cheesy line from Maggie saying, I love you, Alex Wogan. <laughs> okay, anyway. But back to that. Um, he arrived. He wants to take Maggie with with him. So now they'll be they become together, becoming the last starfighter to fight against all the other creatures. And so after all these decisions they had to make, and of course Grid just came, you know, doing this infectious laugh. I, I can't do that, but but it was a good laugh that he was doing. <laughs> so he's kinda like an old man, you know, he, he's very charming. It's really cool. And he's telling everybody that yes, he saved the world, he saved from the war battle and so on and so forth and so now so now Alex along with Maggie and Grid had left together and they just uh, they went on the fight so now <laughs> while Lewis just checks uh, on the uh, Starfighter game the arcade game and so how it turns out and uh, and they're about to leave on the ship for the next adventure. <laughs> okay. And then we, yeah, we also learned that, yes, uh, Centauri is alive. Spoiler. But that's okay. I'm, I'm just glad that, you know, he's doing great. Oh, this is such a fun movie. Um, definitely a feel good film, too. I really felt something, had a lot of great energy that it went into. Uh, Definitely the, the perfect video game movie that you ever got. I mean, that along with Tron. 
I mean, they were, they were the best of, of the bunch, if you think about it. Um, in fact, originally they were going to get an Atari game that's based on the movie. And I know they were planning on that, too, just as soon as the movie was coming out. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And I know they went on to work on that in later years. And I think Atari was going to try to work as much as they can to actually put the game available in stores. So that way everybody can play it based on the movie. Uh, next thing you know, we started getting one for the NES, and we know how that turned out. didn't work. And they later had um, the video game f for PC and also on the internet, too. So now we get to see exactly what the game's supposed to look like that's based on the movie. And it's actually the definitive version of what it's supposed to look like. And it works, and I'm glad to see that it turns out to be the more definitive video game of Starfighter as we all know. Especially with that design that they used for the arcade. And everything. Yeah. It has a wonderful cast, no doubt about it. Um, Lance Guest did a great job uh, playing the role as Alex Rogan, especially when he's playing his double of the beta unit. Um, he gets more of that. But we basically see what he's trying to do, especially when he was on the, the ship with Grig, you know, played by Daniel Hurley. Yeah, you know, they're just, you know, he's like moving around as, as it goes. It's like being inside one of those uh, space, uh, like, yeah, when you're in space camp, you know, you're in one of those machines where it just moves around a lot. It's like you're, you're, like you're floating on air. You know, one of those gravitational uh, uh, machines that they use. It's really cool. Uh, it's hard to believe that he, you know, that he basically felt that energy. But he was very good in this movie, and it's just sad that he went on to do Jaws of Revenge. I mean, yeah, one of the worst movies uh, of the series. Yeah, he plays, um, he plays a young... Uh, Brody, which he just lost his brother. So he's also a marine biologist. The less thing we said about that film, the better. But, but yeah, he went on to do other stuff too uh, later in his career. But unfortunately, he didn't go for bigger and better fans, and that's that's a shame. Because uh, he could have been a bigger star after this movie, and I, I wish he had, because he was very good. Also. Uh, Catherine Mary Stewart was very lovely as uh, Maggie, Alex's girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, they had terrific chemistry. There's no doubt about it. They both had terrific chemistry together. You know, they you can definitely see it. <laughs> Lewis, of course, uh, is played by uh, Chris uh, Hedbert. Yeah, he, he's, he's basically weird. I mean, he goes around just reading all these Playboy magazines uh, that's hidden and, and then he just goes around uh, saying all these um, corny dialogues such as diarrhea and and all of that <laughs> yeah he's very weird um, um, and also Daniel Hurley as I mentioned before was was very good as Grid I mean you definitely can see his uh, character a lot different from his character in Halloween Free Season of the Witch, because he was a villain in that movie. This was a nice change of pace for him. And of course, a lot different from him playing the CEO of OCP Communications and Robocop. <laughs> but this was a different role for him, and it shows. I mean, he he really did enjoy the playing that role. And it's amazing. And I know he's no longer with us, sadly. But still, I mean, he was great. And so was Robert Preston, too. I mean, Robert Preston, you could tell that he really enjoyed playing this role. I mean, he really loved it. If you saw the special features, you'll definitely see that he really enjoyed working on this movie. Because, after all, this, he's basically the music man in the film. But even better. <laughs> it just said that this was his last film, and, you know, he... He's no longer with us. He passed away in 87, as mentioned. 
but he sure had a lot of energy that he went into it and plays him perfectly. He was also in the movie uh, Victor and Victoria. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Uh, the, the Blake Edwards film with Julie Andrews. That's a good movie. Uh, but man, it, it was fun. And, and I love the... I love the special effects that they used in the film. There was a mix of practical effects that they used for, for the shots, but but half of it was also CGI where they created the ships, the movements that they had. That just looks uh, like a video game if you think about it. I mean, it definitely plays like it. They also used the digital effects for the, the video game itself, the arcade, to actually create those... Um, those line effects, uh, all holographic, and all these uh, those graphics that they used to to actually look real here. So it, it was perfect the way they did it. For that budget alone, it just it really worked. And yeah, I mean, a lot of great lines of dialogue, um, especially from that uh, that black neighbor too. Uh, I love that line that he said, uh, all you have is, um, you can make a lot of dreams, you build it with your own hands. I don't know if I said it right, but uh, but I, I love that, uh, that moment that he said to uh, Alex while he was playing the game, so hoping that he'll live with these dreams, because so, he was also working with him on fixing the antenna, only to know that this was the beta unit. Okay, I know. Um, but it's a fun movie. I, I enjoyed it so much. Uh, I I would watch it a, many times already, and I could watch it again and again. Never get tired of it. I know they were going to work on a sequel or a remake and all of that that's going to follow, but I don't know how that's going to happen. I know they were later planning on working on a TV series, which I wouldn't mind seeing a TV series of that as long as they... They have some of the original cast members, which I know Robert Preston and Donald Hurley won't return because they're no longer with us. But I would have loved to see something new for a change. Otherwise, I don't know if that's ever going to happen. That's that's the problem. Um, but who knows? Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll just stick to the original film the way it should be. And plus, I know they were going to work on, on adding the that classic line from the movie that's going to be appearing in Ready Player One. I believe one of the ships is going to appear in the film too. Yeah, the, the new uh, movie that's directed by Steven Spielberg. Okay. So that this is going to be really awesome to see that. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be a lot of appearance of all your favorite nostalgia classics from the 80s and 90s that you'll be familiar with. <laughs> Okay, anyway, back to this. Yeah, I, I love the direction that's done by Nick Castle. He did a great job. He really enjoyed doing this. You can tell. Uh, I love the score that was done by Craig Stefan. Did a great job. He orchestrated it very well. Um, I, I love the themes that they use. Um, it just feels exactly right for, for this movie. Um, yeah, the, the soundtrack just has a lot of does have a bit of Star Wars in a way. Yeah, I, I love the the beginning of, of the main title. It has a wonderful score here that, that just jumps into the place and then even at the end was even better. Um, which was like the love theme at, at the end. It, it has a bit of um, Raiders of the Lost Ark-ish type um, a theme that they mixed in. But it, it just works so well. I love it. Um, I, I wish I had a soundtrack for that. It just it just feels right. Uh, the budget for the film was only $15 million. You know, which added the budget for the, the effects alone. But surprisingly, he actually made some profit when it came out, so it did pretty well at the box office, um, along with the never-ending story. They both came out at the same time. So it, it was it was enjoyable. I really enjoyed the film. Um, also, great cinematography done by Keen Begot. Yeah. 
and all once again the wonderful score uh, a wonderful story a very feel good film a lot of great uh, fighting battles that they got everything it's just and the characters alone the actors that played them all perfect um, I definitely recommend the movie no doubt about it highly recommend it so you should definitely check it out for yourself uh, pick up the blu-ray DVD any other um, edition that you can find um, you'll enjoy it no doubt so anyway I give The Last Starfighter a solid five stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora and I'll see you later. Bye.